Welcome to the Doggy Dojo. I'm your host, Susan Light, a Los Angeles-based dog trainer on a quest to become worthy of the title Sensei of the Doggy Dojo. I'm going to keep this intro short and sweet because this is part two of Canine Nutrition and it's packed with information about how to feed your dog a complete and balanced diet if you choose something other than kibble. I did my best to keep it under 30 minutes, but I think the information was worth running a little over time for. I'm pleased to welcome back the Canine Health Nut, Nikki Juvenelli. Nikki, we're diving right in. I want to reiterate for anyone that skipped part one, the place to start when choosing a food is actually with your vet or a nutritionist. They can tell you what the ideal diet composition for your individual dog would be, and then you can choose a food that meets that composition and also meets your standards, whatever they may be for a quality made product. We talked about kibble last episode. But you start in the same place regardless of what you choose to feed your dog. Get the information about what the diet composition should be and then choose a food to match. So plenty of people don't want to feed their dog kibble for lots of reasons. So let's talk about some of the other options. Raw, fresh food, home cooked, etc. So I think that the big thing with home cooking for your dog or doing like some type of DIY food is one, you're going to have to have some understanding of... um, preparing food and food safety. So Mm -hmm. like how, you know, you need to cook it to a certain temperature in order to, you know, have pathogens be removed, how to source meat so that it's minimally contaminated with pathogens and understanding that raw meat can be contaminated with pathogens for DIY. Um, The other thing is like knowing as far as just for your own safety with food, like vegetables can have contamination with them depending on how they're cleaned and stuff like that. So like if you go into your frozen food section, if it says that you need to cook a a particular type of food, like with spinach or kale, you do need to cook it for your homemade recipe or it may contain E. coli. So there's like little things I feel like that are like learning curves and then also just knowing where your resources are to find complete and balanced recipes. Because most people will be like, oh, well, you know, I eat like uh, some brown rice and some chicken and some vegetables. And they put that the same thing in the bowl for their dog. And they say, well, that's a balanced meal. And I'm like, well, it contains all the macros maybe your dog needs, right? There's a carb, there's a protein, there's some vegetables. That sounds great. But it's missing a whole bunch of different vitamins and minerals. (laughs) So, um, and like we might take a multivitamin, like a human grade multivitamin, like basically that needs a a pet multivitamin that's formulated for homemade dog food Mm. is what that's missing. So um, you need to know where to find those things. And there's tons of resources. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. We've lots of them. So I started cooking for my dogs like seven years ago and we didn't have, I feel like as much uh, available for resources as we do now, or at least they weren't as well known, Um, but we have balance it. So balance is what I started on and I still use today, but it's um, a formulation software that comes with a vitamin mineral supplement that you can or do not have to use. Um, Basically, you just plug in a whole bunch of off of their chart that they have, like choose like protein. Um, You can choose or not choose carbohydrates. You have to choose some type of fat and then fruits and vegetables. And then you can also search for other ingredients if you want something like organ meats or whatever in your food as well. And then it's going to create a recipe for you with certain macro compositions. So it usually gives you three options, a high fat, high protein, a moderate fat protein, and then a high carb. So it gives you like those three macro compositions with your ingredients that you let um, you chose. And that'll come out with a complete and balanced diet. Depending on the ingredients you choose, you may need more or less supplementation. So it depends on the food. So it's really, um, I won't say it's easy to use because there is a learning curve to it. But (laughs) once you get the hang of it, it's, you know, very simple and you, you know, you can figure it out pretty easily. Um, And you can also use that for like certain um, pets that have say multiple concurrent medical conditions or uh, for pets that have um, just like say kidney disease and they don't want to eat a kibble product anymore. So they have um, an easy vet patient generator where you can click that and then you pick the disease or condition and then you put in your vet's information and your information to create an account and they basically send a prescription request to your vet for a prescription um, home cooked meal. Yeah. That's fantastic because one of of my cats is on kidney food and I do need a prescription from the vet 
Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's interesting that even to get a recipe for a prescription diet, uh, you need the the prescription. That's fascinating. I have a question. This software sounds amazing. Is it, do you have to purchase it? Is it, you use it for free on the internet? How does it work? Completely free. Amazing. So the only thing that you have to purchase is the supplement. So say, depending, like I said, of the recipe you create, so you can make a minimally supplemented recipe uh, using like kind of a variety of ingredients and then toggle it to say human supplements. And you can make recipes where you basically just need to supplement iodine and calcium. And that'll be it. You can make other recipes, though, that are more simple. So say just like a carb and a protein or just the protein. And in those cases, you need probably a multivitamin, in which case I usually recommend purchasing the balance supplement because it's a powder um, and it's easy to dose. You can toggle it to human supplements and purchase all the individual human supplements. However, you're going to need like a pill grinder and sometimes you need like an eighth of a tablet and it can Mm. just be, in my opinion, it's too cumbersome. And I find... Anytime when we make homemade recipes and it's cumbersome, people drift away from the recipe. Yeah. And you do not want to OD your dog on these no, supplements. Exactly. So you don't want to accidentally right. give too much or too little yeah. of supplements. So usually if you are doing a simple recipe, I recommend just purchasing one of these multivitamins. And so Balance It has a multivitamin. My pet grocer has a multivitamin supplement, but they don't have a software. So you actually have to use, so petdiets.com is a website from, um, I think there's five boarded nutritionists that are on that website now, but um, they have a whole bunch of recipes that you can purchase and their recipes use the My Pet Grocer supplement. Okay. So in those recipes, I think they start at like $25 each that you can purchase on there. And those are created by board certified veterinary nutritionists. Balance It was put together with a board certified veterinary nutritionist and cohorts at UC Davis and a software engineer. <laughs> awesome. So they it put sounds them, awesome. So those two are there. The other resources that you can use um, as far as starting out with cooking are you can, especially if you're a dog with a whole bunch of different concurrent conditions, you can just go to the acvn.org and that's the American College of Veterinary Nutritionists and they have a directory. And if you search for ones that do client consults, you can actually talk to a boarded nutritionist directly. Um, they are rather expensive. I will say that. I think last time yeah. I checked they're around $400 to talk to one. So um so you can can have a a professional meet your needs directly so you can work with a board of nutritionists directly i usually recommend that say if you have like a dog that has like kidney disease and ibd and like (laughs) uh, liver disease or something like that or like you have a dog that has a whole bunch of different concurrent conditions um or maybe a case that you've tried the typical like nutritional management strategies and they just aren't working I usually recommend going towards a boarded nutritionist because you're just going to solve your issue faster than keep playing around with it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So then that makes it seem almost simpler uh, with these tools to do a home cooked diet if you're willing to put in the work. Oh, yeah. So that's, I guess, the drawback of a home-cooked diet is the amount of time that it takes. Yeah. Um, I would say with my dog, so I have uh, two 50-pound dogs, so bigger dogs. It's a lot of food. It's a lot of food. So Ranger's meal, so he has a weekly batch that I do, has about five pounds of meat. Um, and then along with organs, which is another like half a pound and then fish, which is another half a pound. And then oysters is probably another half a pound. So like you can see like this batch is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And then I have a large rice cooker that I use and I think I cook up about four cups of oats Mm. for him. And that all goes together with supplements to create his complete and balanced diet along with, I add in like a rotation of fresh fruits and vegetables, but like, it's a big batch. You have storage issues as well. Yeah. There's storage issues. So it takes up like one, well, between the two dogs. So two 50 pound dogs is going to take up a whole shelf in my freezer and then a portion of my fridge Yeah, for a weekly batch for two dogs. So I'm basically feeding, you know, the a hundred pounds worth of dog. Um, if you have a smaller dog, I find that it's much easier just because, you know, the batch for Ranger could last you like a month. 
<laughs> yeah. So it's not as like overwhelming. But if you have a big dog, a lot of big dog owners will actually get like their own fridge and freezer for their dog and have yeah. it in their garage. You would have to. You would have to. Yeah. So I haven't invested in that because I don't have the space. But um, that's, you know, space is also an issue if you're in a small apartment or yeah. you don't so have a garage. <laughs> In meeting in the middle there, there are several companies that will cook it for you. Yes. So I think Farmer's Dog is one, Mm -hmm. Um, Just Food for Dogs. Are these people that have tried to meet the need of people who want to feed their dog fresh food from home? Yeah. But don't have time? Exactly. What are your thoughts on these companies? So just like in the kibble realm where we see like a large skew, right? We have some companies that have invested a lot of time and effort to make sure that their products have feeding trials and digestibility trials, and they do good quality control and excellent, um, you know, testing and stuff like that. You see the same skew in the fresh food sector. So for example, Just Food for Dogs is the only fresh food company that has done both AFCO feeding trails for a year and digestibility studies. They're the only one. There's probably 30 or so fresh food companies on the market, but Just Food for Dogs is the only one that has done those two things. Um, Nom Nom Now just published their digestibility studies this year. They okay. still haven't done AFCO feeding trials, though. And Maybe then, they're um, in process with that? Um, so as far as I know, no. No, okay. Um, but, I mean, they could change their opinion on it at some point sure. or maybe want to invest in it at some point. But they just published their digestibility trials. I know Pet Plate does digestibility trials, but they're not published. It's Ooh. just like they've done okay. that in their company they've given me the numbers for it and they look really good so i'm hmm. not sure why they why haven't they chosen haven't to go the extra step to get it published and yeah. peer reviewed but um it's it's there so some companies may have done the studies but not published them um okay. and then some companies have really good quality control procedures and others um when i've contacted them about that they say that they source the best ingredients and you'll see this across the board with kibbled and fresh food companies but sourcing the best ingredients does is not a quality control procedure in its entirety um human food so like if you go to your grocery store and you go pick up chicken 50% 50% of the chicken in the, the store is going to be contaminated with some type of pathogen. Mm. Same with like beef products. Now there is limitations on chicken as far as salmonella is concerned. Only 20% I think are allowed to contain salmonella, but there's other pathogens that can be present in meat, even human meat. And that's why they recommend us cook it. Um, mm-hmm. So the fact that they choose the best ingredients, so a human-grade meat product, does not necessarily mean that they are free of pathogens. So we'd still want to test to make sure there wasn't a cross-contamination issue within mm-hmm. the, you know, the, the line of cooking or something like that. Um, so some yeah. companies will, will have test and hold procedures. So test and hold means that basically before the food ends up in your hands as a consumer, they have tested it for things like mycotoxins, um, salmonella, E. coli, campylobacter, um, a- aflatoxin toxins. Some of them will even do heavy metals. It kind of depends on the brand and there's no standardization of what has to be tested for. Um, but So again, it's just this company seeking to go the extra mile. Yes. It's the company looking to do more. It's not the government's bodies requiring, requiring yeah. them to do a certain wow. amount. Um, AFCO does have recommendations for what are called good manufacturing practices. So they recommend companies use them, but they don't have really good. I would say that the good manufacturing practices are loose. (laughs) Wow. So it might even say that, but it's not that high of a standard. Well, basically it means they have a quality assurance program that tests for pathogens at some time, but it doesn't like stipulate how often or what type of testing exactly they have to do. It just means that there's a program in place to do testing. Honestly, it's a big step for AFCO because they didn't have this. I think they started it. I'd have to look at my notes. It was somewhere in the late, like, 2016, maybe 2018, they enacted good manufacturing practices. Before that, they didn't even have that. So it's a step in the right direction for AFCO. Um, Hopefully, we'll continue to see them kind of migrate towards more requirements. (laughs) 
We're taking a short break. Remember, you can find Nikki's blog at www.thecaninehealthnut.com, and she's Canine Health Nut on Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, and Twitter. I encourage you to find her on one of these platforms and avail yourself to all her knowledge. She offers one-on-one consultations, and she's done a ton of this legwork for you already. We'll be right back. It's crazy how it sounds like mostly, for, as far as safety is concerned, uh, the government is more reactionary. Yes. Like, we, I want to come back to recalls. It's not uncommon, unfortunately, for pet food to be recalled. Mm-hmm. Um, but that stuff still was allowed to hit the market because clearly, as you've said, the testing is not there to make sure it's safe before it gets into our hands. Right. So a good company would do a test and hold procedure to check product before it goes to market. Some companies will do like um, random batch testing. So what they do is after products have gone to the market, they pull so many batches and test them randomly for pathogens. And that's where like the recent recalls, a couple of them, they actually said this, the reason for this recall was because of um, testing that happened at our company, not at another company. Like it wasn't the FDA that required it. It was, they realized. They just didn't hold. Yeah. They just didn't hold it To wait for the test result. Yes. So they didn't hold it it and make sure that it was negative. They just randomly tested it afterwards and was like, oh, that's not good. Oh, darn. Let's let's bring that back. So (laughs) ideally, in my opinion, it should probably be done at the beginning of the chain rather than the like retroactively, um, sure. but we don't have any requirements for that right now. Wow. Um, the other thing that will happen with recalls is, uh, and this happened, I think with the Nom Nom now had like a cat food recall. So if in, say you source ingredients and the ingredient is recalled because it was contaminated by another product that used like the same base product. So in the Nom Nom uh, recall for cat food, they had used a um, pre-cooked Um, chicken within their cat food. And that pre-cooked chicken was found to have um, pathogens in the human food market. But since the sourcing was the same, it cascaded to cause the recall on Nom Nom's uh, cat food, which is a fresh food, human grade product. So that can happen. So usually, um, you know, some companies, when they see that happening, what they usually do is they'll switch suppliers and ideally they start to implement some type of quality control procedure that would prevent that from happening. So they did say that they had um, a certificate of analysis that said that it was free of pathogens, but obviously there was some type of issue there. But we see that with um, kibbled products. Um, if, say, you're they're using a co-manufacturer, which is like a plant, a manufacturing plant that manufactures a whole bunch of different brands of kibble, um, you'll see that that manufacturing plant, if one food is recalled from that plant, there'll be a cascade of other foods within the same plant that mm-hmm. are all recalled because of the one that was comes back positive for whatever it is. I know that there was like a cascade of salmonella recalls. I can't remember if it was 2005 or something. It was like early 2000s. And it was all because all of these kibbled products were all manufactured in the same manufacturing plant, even though the companies, some of the companies said that their products hadn't tested positive. They were recalled just in case. So, so I think people can find information about thing, past recalls, but it's, mm-hmm. it doesn't sound like it's going to help you predict whether the food you're feeding your pet will be recalled or not. No. Unless they test and hold. Uh, yeah, that's so the one we want to look for for that. Usually what I recommend is look at the recall history. And if you see something happening over and over and over again, sure. then I feel like we haven't learned our lesson, right? So like mm-hmm. if we see the same food, constantly recalled for salmonella despite them changing their their procedures i feel like you in some ways with a company i was like well this has been happening consistently for several years like yeah i think we need to see some really big overhauls here before i would necessarily say that your, your food is free of x you know whatever that thing is so if you do see like a consistent recall history i think that does speak volumes but like one recall history and then they recognize that there's a problem and then they change a whole bunch of things to account for that mm-hmm. i feel like with any business right if you make a mistake and then you make efforts to make sure it never happens again. Mm -hmm. 
I, I would then, say, you know, you, yeah. you did a good job, right? Like that's sure. you recognizing there's an issue and then going from there. So, so I have, um, rambled on for a very long time and this may be the last question I get to ask. Certainly not all the questions I, I have know, for you, I'm but sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, it's incredibly illuminating. I so appreciate it. Um, but I just want to ask for your thoughts or advice about a picky eater, because let's say we've gone to all this trouble. I have cooked you this food, dog. I have a week worth of this food for you to eat, and they don't want to eat it. Or I've done all this research. I bought this kibble. What if they don't eat it? What do you do? So I think that this, there's a lot of reasons why a pet won't eat. So I always say, like, if your dog isn't eating, talk to your vet. Make sure there's not something else going on. Um, and the only reason why I say that is because my dog Ash would refuse to eat breakfast when he was younger. And then um, he would have an upset stomach. He wouldn't be feeling well. Sometimes he wouldn't be feeling well, so he wouldn't eat. And once we actually found a diet that was appropriate for him, that worked well with him, he started eating consistently. And I know many cases where the picky dog was actually ill and they didn't display yeah, any other clinical themselves. signs except for that, huh? Yeah. Self-regulating themselves, like that makes me feel bad. Yeah, like that doesn't make me feel well, so I'm not going to eat yeah. it. You see it also with different diseases and conditions, like very commonly like kidney disease. They'll associate the nausea of kidney disease with a particular diet, so you'll find yourself kind of rotating through diets. Mm. Um rather than staying consistently on one, especially towards end stages of something like that. So I usually say first, go to your vet and rule out other diseases and conditions, especially if there's any other clinical signs going on. But even if there's not, rule that out to begin with so you know that you know you have a healthy dog when you're going to look to make adjustments. And then from there, I usually kind of look towards like scientific research. So research says that dogs prefer foods that are high fat, high protein, uh, that mm -hmm. are moist over foods that are low fat, low protein and not moist. So there's a whole bunch of different research studies that have looked at, like if you take a kibble and then you like top it with, um, you know, uh, some type of like chicken broth to make it smell even better. Suddenly a dog will be more likely to eat that than it without that on top if that makes sense. So there's a whole bunch looking yeah. at like sensory and with uh, texture and stuff like that. Do you think um, you can create a picky eater though? Oh yeah, you can. Trying to appeal to them all the time. Oh, I definitely think you can. And, um, I think that for me, because I'm not, so I'm not a behavioralist, so I don't feel like I can speak too much to the behavior aspect of it. What I can do is give people tools to pick like a highly palatable diet. And if that doesn't work, then you may need to start to go towards like almost behavior modification yeah. um, in order to help your dog be promoted to eat. Actually, my general recommendations is that you would want to basically do a feeding where basically you put in whatever your dog's going to eat. So I'd recommend the highly palatable food, especially if your dog hasn't eaten consistently in the past, put that high fat, yeah. high protein food down and leave it there for, you know, maybe 10 minutes, allow your dog to eat if they want to, if they walk away, I say, honor their hunger. So you pick it up, cover it, put it in the fridge. And then if you're at home, great. If you're not at home, then um, maybe do this on a weekend where you're there because then an hour or two later, you're going to take that same food and you're going to decide and make a decision of, do I want to top this item now or do I want to just continue to offer the same item? Mm -hmm. And usually I say like, just put it down the same as before and see what happens. So you put it down again, exactly how it was before. You might want to mix it up or something like that if you want to make it the aroma come up again um, and offer it and see if they want to eat it. And you kind of repeat. And basically the thing is that you don't pick up the food, top it and put it back down. Each time mm. you're putting it away for a substantial period of time, at least an hour or two. And then you're going to also look at the environment by which you're feeding. So sometimes people will feed in an environment that is busy or in an environment that is too quiet. So some dogs are social eaters. And I've seen before oh, how interesting. where a dog will oh. only eat if you eat. I don't know why, but it happens. <laughs> it's really oh odd. So I'll have the person sit at the dinner table, present the dogs, like basically take the bowl from the dinner table and put it on the ground next to them. And they eat dinner and their dog will eat dinner because they're a social eater. 
I have other dogs that are scared. So they just have a lot of anxiety or maybe that's just everything's so exciting. They need a quiet place to eat. So that might be like a separate room in a corner or like, especially like the hyperactive puppies. Sometimes they just want to play so much. They forget that they need to eat. (laughs) Um, So you may need to give them a space that is quiet and not distracting in order for them to focus on eating food. So there's a little bit of like watching your dog and how they respond to certain situations. Um, Sometimes I've also found that like if you have a social eater or a dog that's used to getting a lot of table scraps, have their bowl next to your plate and then just use a fork that is for your dog and literally just take the fork and then you put it on a plate that is on the ground. So it's almost like you're feeding them from the table, but it's going into you're a plate. Feeding them their food. Yeah, yeah, and it's their food rather than just your food. Um, and that can sometimes, you know, the, the aspect of feeding from the table is still there. And then you'd slowly wean towards feeding by themselves. So you might put more and more food for them to eat at a time rather than little bites. That yeah. can sometimes help. Um Other things that I have tried as far as with piggy dogs in the past is potentially heating food. So making it smell tastier. I usually don't. That's pretty common advice. Yeah. I usually don't recommend it chronically though. And the reason is, is because any food, when you heat it, it's going to lose certain vitamins and minerals that are heat sensitive that they've added on after the cooking process. So if you home cook though, you can choose. So the balance it plus hat is heat stable for one reheating. So you can actually Mm. use that, make a homemade diet that is high fat, high protein, add the balance it to it. You can offer it cold. If they don't want to eat it, you can heat it up one time for them to eat. And some picky eaters just always like it heated. And in which case you can do that for as long as you'd like with the balance it because it's made to do that. So, um, and that's the balance it plus, not the balance it regular. Yeah. Uh, Balance, that means that's a different supplement or that's a different program so it's the same program but um they have a whole bunch of different supplements so you'll notice if you go to their supplements tab they have a like balance it regular it comes in like a black label then there's the balance it plus which is the heat stable that has a white label then they have balance it k for kidney disease and count balance it cu for liver disease and then they have one for cats so they have a, a feline um oh, a balance it and then they have a feline uh, k so for kidney disease they don't have a liver disease for cats um but they do have a kidney disease one for kitties so so i have i am going to push and ask one more question no, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um the difference puppies and adult food so i just want to make sure that we touch on this because i think it's a big deal mm-hmm. um puppies have to eat different food than adults because they're still growing right so they do make puppy kibbles mm-hmm. um and so quickly because i i feel like most people will understand the answer to this when would you switch from puppy to adult food and then we'll circle back and talk about like puppy formulations but uh when you when is the appropriate time to switch them from puppy to adult food so there's two two different things one is when your dog is done growing so when the growth plates have closed you can now transition on to adult food that's the ideal time is when your puppy is done growing so depending on the puppy if you have a chihuahua that might be nine months if you have a great dane that might be two years yeah. So that's and the how ideal do you tell? Time. Do you need an X-ray at the vet? Do you um, need the vet to technically, tell you? technically, I guess that would be like a gold standard is to do an X-ray to see if the gold growth plates have closed. However, we know on average that's mm-hmm. the range. Usually, small breed gra- dogs are around nine months to a year, and giant breed dogs are around two years. If you keep your dog on a puppy food for too long, so say if you have a Chihuahua and you kept it on puppy food for a year and a half, it's not going to cause harm. Oh, okay. So you can go a little over. So That's fine. Air, air maybe on the side of yeah. keeping them on puppy food a little longer. Exactly. Or you can change to like an all life stage food, which would be for puppies and adults. So it's actually formulated for puppies, um, but you can feed it to adults or puppies. So you could do oh, an all life stage food as well. Um, and then I usually say around six months is when you switch from three meals a day to two. Um do you think that that is still accurate or you do it around the same time you transition the food? Um, it's honestly, for me, it just depends on the dog. So we know that large breed dogs, they actually metabolically burn calories a lot slower than small breed dogs do. So um, 
on a caloric basis, your chihuahua is going to burn through twice as many calories for its size than a Great Dane is. So they just, they're like little hummingbirds. Like they just go, 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 right? So they have really, really fast metabolisms. So for little dogs, I usually recommend transitioning between like, you know, five to four to three to two slower and just kind of watching your dog's temperament. For a large breed dog, you can do it a little bit sooner. So it doesn't necessarily correlate to when they would be off of adult food. It's more to do with their metabolism and what like blood glucose. So for example, with a small breed dog, like a little tiny puppy, um, we'd see them in clinic a lot at like eight, six weeks old, something like that. If the breeder decided to release them too early, which I won't get into, but um, we'd see these little like toy breed dogs that are, you know, less than a pound and the owners would come in. They're like, oh, he's acting really lethargic and not like himself and everything like that. And we'd, be, we'd look at him and everything. We'd be like, oh, I'll be right back in a minute. I was like, do you mind if I give your dog some food? He's like, oh, you know what? He's, we offer him a food he's on a dry food but you know wait I don't think he's eating that much and I was like well he's little but maybe that's what it is and we'll give him like something highly palatable like a I don't know canned AD hills which is like super high fat high protein and they'll just gobble it right up and then suddenly they perk up right away and they're hypoglycemic that's the lethargy Mm. that they're seeing so these little dogs because they burn through calories so fast if they don't get calories on a frequent enough basis they will actually go hypoglycemic and become really lethargic and kind of off and it'll seem like they're kind of sick so i usually say like when you're going to transition your dog especially a little dog like a toy or small braid just watch for those signs and if when you start to wean off of that like middle meal or you know down you start to see them acting different as far as being kind of lazy or lethargic put the Mm -hmm. meal back in there's no rush to get them on two meals a day okay yeah yeah sounds good so then what's different about puppy food and adult food like what does the puppy need uh or vice versa maybe it's the other way around (laughs) so the main difference is calcium to phosphorus ratios So puppies need a different calcium to phosphorus ratio, more controlled calcium to phosphorus ratio than an adult does. So at about six months of age, kind of depending on the breed, this is going to have some leeway of um, before six months versus after six months. But basically around six months of age, your puppy can now actually excrete excess calcium. Before six months of age, your puppy is going to take in excess calcium. So if you feed a a diet that is too high in calcium, so it has too much calcium in comparison to phosphorus, or just the calcium to phosphorus ratio is true or what the puppy needs, but just the amounts are really high, your puppy will actually end up with bone abnormalities. So they have because to have a control. They will store all the extra calcium yep, in their it's bones. It's going to go to their bones and they're not wow. going to be able to, um, the bones will start to grow abnormally. They sometimes end up with like little projections off of them or they'll have abnormally shaped bones. Um, obviously, you can have like the reverse as well. Like, say the ratio isn't quite right on the other end, so your puppy's not getting enough calcium. Puppies can yeah. get rickets, just like <laughs> that would have been my concern because they're growing, right? So a lot of people, what they'll do need more, yeah, yeah. A lot of people um will do a couple of things with puppies that are like not good for them. One is they'll give them calcium supplements, thinking they need more calcium, or really they need a ratio and then control that a specific amount. They do need more, but they need it in a ratio to phosphorus. It can't just be by itself or it doesn't Got work it. and you don't want yeah. too much of it or you end up with problems. So the main thing with puppies is that calcium to phosphorus ratio. You want it in a certain ratio in order to, you know, make your puppy grow effectively. Um, as far as other aspects of the diet, um, most of those are accomplished with just because your puppy's going to eat more. So like puppies have higher protein needs yeah. than uh, adult dogs, but your puppy's going to consume twice twice as much food. So (laughs) they're going to probably cover that with just the fact that they're going to consume more of things. Um, The ratio is what really makes puppy diets unique to puppies. And so how then is it possible to have an all life stage food that's appropriate for puppies and adults? They just formulate it for puppies. And it's not harmful for the dog, Mm. for the adult. That's why you were saying an adult eating a puppy food isn't as harmful yeah, as it's, a puppy eating adult food. So we do have kind of this theory of the sense of if you do give dogs, so say you do have an adult dog that's been on a puppy food for too long, 
it may be detrimental depending on how much access they are getting of certain things. So say the adult dog does get more, um, say, calcium on a regular basis, and that particular breed is prone to calcium oxalate stones, you could end up with an issue that way. Or say if you have a dog, an older dog that is on an all-life stage food, those since it's formulated for puppies, it's probably going to be higher in fat and protein. But say mm -hmm. your d dog is obese prone, mm. then you might have weight gain and that could shorten lifespan. So sure. you do have the kind of this, I guess, um, there's aspects of having a lot uh, on all life stage food where you're not optimizing for the particular life stage you're on. So it may not be optimal for that dog. But if Got you it. use an all life stage food for like that transition period of like puppyhood to an adulthood, that makes, you know, if that's a little bit more comfortable or maybe you need something slightly less calorically dense than the puppy food, it kind of depends on the brand in this case, but you can do that for, you know, that transition period if you want to move towards an adult food, but don't, aren't quite there yet. I love that. Let's, I, I know I said that was my last question, but we, <laughs> I think because we're talking about food and switching foods, uh, let's really quickly touch on, like you said, the transition period, because um, you don't want to just be feeding your dog one thing one day and the next day you give them a completely different diet. Um, let's talk about the proper way to transition from one food to another. Yeah, sure. So this is going to depend on your dog a little bit, but most dogs do well with a week-long transition. So between four days to seven days, you basically take out a little bit of the old food and put in a little bit of the new food over a seven-day period. That's usually what most dogs will do well on. So you'll do like 25-75, then 50-50, then 75-25, then 100%. And you do maybe each like increment in like two days. Um, my usual dictation on something like that is that your transition, when you go to do a transition and you're trying a completely new food that you've never been on before, if your dog, say at 2575, starts to have loose stool, don't continue with the transition. Stay mm, at 75, stay there Okay. for until the stool's normalized, then go to the next stage because, and this is, I think, just like personal experience speaking here, I have tried to transition Ash onto some diets and he never could get all the way onto the diet without having loose stool. I had mm. to backpedal and try something okay. else. So yeah. it is possible that you go to transition your dog onto something and they aren't going to do well on that diet. And you may need to find something else. You may need to backpedal slowly back onto the old diet and kind of go from there. You can add on a probiotic if you want um, during the process to make it a little bit easier. But like, I know some people say like, oh, just continue through it because, you know, the loose stool is just your dog detoxing from their old diet, which I really find uh, frustrating as far as a thing to say um, about loose stool because it's not, it's the microbiome adjusting to the new diet the new ingredients, the new composition, all of that needs to be adjusted. And some yeah. dogs can do a day transition, but most dogs do not do that. Some dogs have guts of steel. <laughs> yeah. Like my yeah. dog Ranger can do that. He literally can eat one thing one day and the next thing the other day. And he's like, yeah, I'm fine. We're good. <laughs> and it yeah. doesn't affect him at all. Whereas yeah. like Ash, most of his transitions are two weeks long. Yeah. And especially true if you're bringing home a puppy, a lot of breeders and rescues will, if they're not sending you home with some of the food, they're at least telling you what they've been feeding them mm -hmm. so that you have time to keep them on that long enough to transition on to whatever you're going to feed them. Right. And I usually say if you're going to bring home a new puppy, like say it's the first month or so that you have your puppy, don't transition the food. Keep the food exactly the same. That's great advice. Because There's enough different stuff going on in that dog's exactly. life Exactly. You have moment. so much stress going on that if yeah. you choose to chew, like, so we already know that stress causes loose stool. Mm -hmm. So if you try to transition during a stressful period, you're probably going to end up with loose stool. So instead, maybe wait like that two to three month transition period of like, this is my new home and my new environment. I'm learning new things, all that kind of stuff. Keep the food the same. It might not be the brand you want, but I promise in just a couple months, it's not going to make a couple uh, a huge difference, right? Like it's not <laughs> between the, the different foods. It's not going to be significant in a couple of months of keep them on that. At least do it for the first month of the same food and then do a transition just so that they have that extra time to just adjust to your house. So I love that. That's fantastic. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. 
I uh, what's amazing to me is that uh, this is going to be a two part episode. Clearly, what's amazing <laughs> to me is that most of my questions are actually were obsolete once we started talking and you were explaining things. Like I did, I wasn't even going to ask you the right questions. Like that's what's amazing about like learning, uh, based on you know instead of what I was assuming and thinking. Yeah, you know I, what I mean. I feel like. And this is just something that I've found just over the years is that when you start to look at something like nutrition and the aspects of nutrition, I feel like you come in with like a perceived preconceived notion of what nutrition is. And you maybe have a really simple aspect of something, but as you learn more, you're like, oh my God, this is like a beast. It is not that simple. <laughs> and yeah. and it, it comes down to, you know, oh, well, these, these things, maybe this doesn't actually matter, or maybe there's too much emphasis on something through like, you know, things that you've read online, like. I know there's so much stuff that's online oh, where yeah. it's putting emphasis on really small factors that like when we look at the big picture of health, it's probably not as significant as we think it is. So um, I'm really glad to, you know, come here and talk to you. And I, it's been really fun. Um, I, oh my gosh, I probably rambled in some areas a little bit too much, but <laughs> I don't think so. I, I wish we could talk longer, but I, I am going to cut it off as you can hear i had the hardest time ending our conversation i always had one more question i wanted to ask thank you nikki for joining me today i learned so much i honestly encourage all of you to seek out nikki or another nutritionist to help you sort out the best food for your dog my takeaways from this are that nutrition is complicated, but you can seek out a professional to put you on the right path and then use a tool like Balance It to craft a food that's perfect for your dog or do some research on what brands of fresh food, kibble or raw diets, etc., uh, would also meet your dog's needs while upholding high standards, not just of, quote, the best ingredients, end quote, but of testing and manufacturing practices that can keep your dog safe. Phew! If you want to go more in depth with this topic, remember, Nikki has tons of information online for free at her blog and her social media pages, and they are all linked in the show notes. Thank you for stopping by the dojo to learn with me this week. This is your aspiring sensei, Susan Light, signing off. You can find me at www.doggydojopodcast.com or I'm at Susan Light, L-A, on Instagram, Pinterest, and Facebook. The music was written by Mac Light. You can find him at maclightsongwriter.com. And if you like the show, you can support it by subscribing, sharing it with your friends, rating it, or reviewing it on Apple Podcasts. I'll be back in two weeks with another new episode of the Doggy Dojo.